Do you want your clicker? Do you remember your number? Just go ahead and click in for attendance. Okay. All right, so last class, um, we had stopped here at the end of this problem, yes? And uh, we need to finish it up. But I wanted to just kind of um, remind you that you have these formula sheets in Canvas that you can have on the test. Um, the formulas, there's six reference pages. And on reference page five, numbers 19, 20, and 21 are probably the important formulas from last class. We learned that there are derivatives of the inverse trig functions, and these are them, all right? So this is where you would find them here, but I put them on the board in case we need to use them today. But also remember that there's three other inverse trig functions. There's inverse secant, inverse cosecant, inverse um, cotangent, right? Those all have derivatives also, and they're in this, in this formula sheet. We just didn't, we didn't derive them, all right? Clickers are over here. Um, so, back to this problem. So we had, we had gotten through this rocket that was being launched and we drew our pictures, figured out what we were given, what we wanted, and we had come up with an equation. That's where we had said we're going to need to differentiate this with respect to time, right? Yes? Okay. So, right now if I differentiate this with respect to time, what would I get on the left-hand side? We have to differentiate the tangent function, right? Mm -hmm. Which would be secant squared, right? So we would get, so I'm taking the derivative with respect to time on the left side, and I'm taking the derivative with respect to time on the right side. Now remember, the reason why we came up with this equation that had theta and y in it were because I'm given how fast y is changing with respect to time, and I want to know how fast theta is uh, changing with respect to time. Remember, we want to know how fast the observer's angle of inclination is changing. So we came up with some relationship between theta and y using this triangle, tangent theta is y over 1. And then if we differentiate it with respect to time, we should get these two things to pop out. So derivative of this with respect to time is what? Secant squared theta, and then the supercritical thing you need next to it. d theta dt. So this is the chain rule. The derivative of tangent of something is secant squared of that something, but then you need to take the derivative of the argument, which is theta. The derivative of theta with respect to time is d theta dt. So this is d theta dt. And we need that here because that's what we're looking for, right? We need it to somewhere, somehow appear. And then this will be equal to, now what's the derivative of y with respect to t? dy dt. And we need that to appear also because dy dt is given to us. So somewhere in here we need that, dy dt. I'll write this up a little higher. I can see some of y'all can't see that. So here's where we are. We have, we have secant squared theta times d theta dt equals dy dt. And at this point, after you do the differentiation, is when you can start plugging things in. So I told you last class, and I don't know if you remember, I said, we can do this problem without using any of this stuff over here at all. We, we can do it. So I'm going to do it, and then we're going to go back and do the problem again, and I'm going to use something here, and I'm going to try and see if you can see the difference between the two approaches, which one's easier, which one's harder, all right? So right here, I'm trying to solve for d theta dt, right? That's what I'm looking for. I'm trying to find out what that is. Do I know dy dt? Yep. Yes, that was 1,000, wasn't it? Do I know theta? Well, I have to look at the instant in time. And so really, theta was this angle right here. Theta is here, right? So I don't actually know theta right away, do I? I have to go figure out what theta is. But I can do it, right? 
I can do it. I can find theta. I can find the angle off this triangle. So let's, let's proceed. I'm going to just rewrite this. Or you know what? Let's get theta right now. I know that from this picture, I need theta, right? I need theta to do that. So I know that tangent theta equals 3 over 1. So if I take the arctangent on both sides, I get theta equals arctangent of 3. Right? Say, say what? How did you do that? I, you know where this came from? Yeah, this, this right here, this yeah, picture. Yeah, sure. Right, this is a right triangle. Uh -huh. And so I took arctangent on this side. Arctangent of tangent of theta just gives you theta. Interesting. Right? That's, that's the inverse property. The fact that if you compose a function with its inverse, it'll wipe, wipe each other out, right? And I do it on this side, I get this. Right? So I actually have a formula for theta. But what is it that I actually want to know here? I want to know what secant theta is, right? And then I need to square it. So I could use this as my theta and then plug that in right here, couldn't I? But in reality, working off this triangle, what would secant on this triangle be? Secant, by definition, is the reciprocal of cosine, yes? Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. Yeah? So even though I could go over here and figure out theta, if I realize I'm just looking for secant theta, if I just build this triangle up, I can figure out what secant theta is just by looking at it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what is this side of the triangle? How would we get it? A squared plus B squared is C squared. So root 10. This is root 10. I trust that everyone here could solve that. So Without, without this, you know, okay, if we don't want to do this and we just want to know what secant theta is because that's ultimately what we want to, want to find, what would secant theta be off of our triangle? Root 10. Root 10 over 1, which is root 10. Yes? Understand? So let's, let's complete this. I have secant theta, which is root 10 squared, because I'm squaring it, and then times d theta dt, which is what I'm solving for, equals dy dt, which was 1,000. And the left side is root 10 squared, which is just 10, and then divide both sides by 10, you should get d theta dt is what? 100, right? 100 what? So it's, this is giving us a rate of change in our angle with respect to time, right? How is time measured in this problem? How fast was the rocket traveling? Hours, hours right? Miles per hour, miles per hour. So our time unit in this problem is hours. So I know this is 100 something per hour, but what is it? The angle, how are we measuring the angle? It's always radians unless you choose to then convert it to degrees afterward. So this is going to be radians per hour. Rad, I'll put rad per hour. So this rocket, the, the guy's standing a mile away, he's got his binoculars, he's looking at this rocket, this rocket takes off, he's rotating to try and keep up with it, and when the rocket is three miles high at that exact moment, that exact instant in time, his, rot his rate of rotation is 100 radians per hour, which a second later, his rotation's different. But at that instant, that's the rotation, the rate of rotation. So you use radians when you're dealing with angles, right? Well, you're, you're, you deal, we're dealing with um, radians because radian is kind of like what we call like a unitless measure of an angle. Um, degrees, like we can convert this to degrees per hour. Yeah. We just multiply it by 180, divide by pi. Right. But otherwise, it's going to be radians the whole time. So it's almost like degrees is um, something we convert to at the end, but you leave it as radians the whole time you're working the problem out. Right. Yeah, and I'm just specifically talking about, like, you wouldn't use radians if we're talking about how, how long would it, how fast is it, like, like distance from a place. Instead of how long does it take to either when we're talking about distances, yeah, we're not going to use radians. Right. Radians are just for angle yeah. measures. Yeah. And so all angles have some radian measure and some degree measure, right? right? Mm -hmm. All right, now I do ask what it is in degrees per second, right? That's the, that's the final question there. What is that in degrees per second? So we would have to finish this off. 
we would have to take 100 radians per one hour HR and convert it into degrees per second. So you have to do unit conversion here. So let's get rid of the hours first and get it to seconds. So the way we do that, we multiply by hour on top. One hour is how many seconds, do you know? 3,600. I mean, you could go hours to minutes first. Uh, one hour, 60 minutes, right? That would get your hours to cancel. And then you'd go like one minute is 60 seconds. You get your minutes to cancel. So essentially, you're going to multiply by 3,600 on the bottom. That would get us from hours to seconds. How do we get from radians to degrees? You multiply by 180 degrees and divide by pi. So let's pi, sorry, I should say pi radians so that you can see that the radians cancel. So I don't have my calculator, so maybe someone can do this for me. You're going to do 100 times 180 and then divide that by 3600 times pi. Sorry? You get, go ahead and give me a decimal. Yeah, give me the decimal. 1.59, let's get somebody to agree. Yes, 1.59, what? Degrees per second. So that number, I think, is a little bit easier for us to put our heads around, right? Like, you know, one degree, it's not a very big angle. At that instant in time, he's rotating at about one and a half or so degrees per second. All right. Any questions? I'd like to do this problem. I said I could make it a little bit easier, right? I said. So I'm going to go back now. I'm going to go back to the place where we had the equation. We had tangent theta equals y, right? And we differentiated that with respect to time, didn't we? And when we did that, we got secant squared theta times d theta dt. And that secant squared theta forced us to go figure out what secant theta was, right? We had to use our triangle and everything. So instead of using that equation, what I'd like to do is take arc tangent on both sides right now. So what would happen if you take arc tangent of tangent of theta? You just get theta here. And what happens if you take arc tangent of y? You just get arc tangent of y, right? Now, why is this going to be easier for us to work with? Let's, let's look at this. What is the derivative of this side with respect to time? D theta. d theta dt, right? OK. So we're differentiating now with respect to time. I'm just going to put a little, we're differentiating with respect to time now. OK, so if I did left side, I get d theta dt. Now on the right side, what is the derivative of arc tangent of something? 1 over 1, one, over one plus that something squared, right? So 1 over 1 plus y squared, but then times chain rule, the derivative of the argument. What's the derivative of y with respect to t? Dy, dt. dy dt, right? Now, why is this one better to work with than the last one? This is what we want, right? It's what we're looking for. And in order to find it, we need to know y and we need to know dy dt. Do we know dy dt? Yes. yes. Do we know y? Yes. yes. See, we don't have to go do secant and all that. It's, it, it's not here anymore, right? Do y'all see that? So if I just work this out, this would be 1 over 1 plus, what was y? Three. 3. So 3 squared is 9. And then times dy dt was 1,000. And this is going to be 1 over 10. So this is going to give you 100 again, isn't it? So you get the same answer. You should get the same answer, shouldn't you? So this is 100 uh, radians per hour. Do you see that just that, that real quick little this piece right here made this math a lot easier? OK? And I guess the thing that would make you do that is the fact that what we're looking for, if we can somehow get our equation to have what we're looking for, that variable isolated. Since it's isolated, I know when I take the derivative of it with respect to time, I just get that, what I'm looking for. 
as opposed to it being buried in with some other stuff. Hope that makes sense. Yeah? Okay. All right, that is it for this section. We were, we were not able to finish that out. Um, how'd the homework go, okay? Or? 32 is a weirdo. Is a weirdo? Yeah, 28 and 32. Did I work them out on you video? Did, but you did some witchcraft. I did witchcraft. Well, that's, I'm proud of myself then. You did. You even said this was going to be a messy one. Let me, let me look at it. I haven't worked it in a while. You did some funny thing, like you split, on 32, I think you split like the square root of uh, like 1 plus x squared, and, one, and you put it in one of the numerator and one of the denominator. I'm like, what? This is 30. Number 32, is that the one It's like arc tangent of x times y? No, it's this one. Sorry, oh yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Twenty-eight, yeah. Okay, but I did, but I did work it, right? Yeah, I'm, okay, I did work it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, we're moving on to three six, which are the hyperbolic trig functions. We haven't really, I mean, we, we've, I guess, technically started Cal 2, but we really haven't got to like the heart of what this is about. We're just getting some ancillary trig stuff out of the way to begin, making sure we, we know these derivatives of these inverse trig functions. And now we're going to talk about the hyperbolic trig functions. So <clears throat> there are six new trig functions called the hyperbolic trigonom trigonometric functions that are very different than your standard trig functions. So you have like sine of x, cosine of x, tangent x. Now we have these new ones. They're written with an h after the, like after the sine, you put h there, and then of x, this is your hyperbolic sine function. And the definition of the hyperbolic sine function is very different than the definition of the sine function. Like, you know, the sine function from calculus or pre-cal how did we define sine of x? Like, what was the definition of sine of x? It was, uh, so, it was just the opposite over. Yeah, so it was basically based upon a triangle or a circle. You could either, you could define sine in terms of a triangle or a circle, right? Right triangle or circle. Op this would be um, Sokotoa, so opposite over hypotenuse, something like that. That's how we defined our sine function. Cosine was similar in tangent. But with the hyperbolic functions, they're actually, they're just weird, okay? They are some combination, some linear combination, meaning that it's just the summers, summer difference of two exponential functions. And that's the definition of the hyperbolics. So in this case, sine hyperbolic of x, the definition of it is one half times the quantity e to the x minus e to the negative x. So we all know what e to the x looks like, right? The graph of that, e to the x, goes like that, right? And then e to the negative x, that one is like reflected. So e to the x looks like this. e to the negative x looks like this. And somehow what we're doing is we're like taking this one and subtracting that one and then taking half of it. And I'm going to show you the graph, of, the graph of this function in a second. but. The important thing, I guess, for you to understand is that it's not your good old right triangle circle thing. It's something else. And the reason why these are important is because these come up a lot. These quantities, e to the x, e to the negative x, come up a lot in physics, chemistry, engineering. A lot, a lot of times we see these e to the x's combined together like this. And so we have these special functions, these hyperbolic trig functions. That's how we define them. All right, so if I were to ask, uh, well, let me just finish going through these. Um, what's the difference between the sine hyperbolic function and the cosine hyperbolic function? There's subtraction in here, and there's addition. That's the only difference between the two, OK? So if you can kind of memorize that, then just subtract, add. All right, and then tangent hyperbolic of x is just the ratio of the sine over the cosine. So just like it was in the pre-cal, sine is, you know, tangent is sine over cosine, right? So same thing here, hyperbolic tangent is this one divided by this one. And then cosecant hyperbolic is just one over that one. 
secant hyperbolic is just one over this one. So it's, it, all of that remains the same. All right, is that all right? Okay, so here are some plots. This is a plot of a hyperbolic cosine function right here. There's a plot of it right there. Just to give you an idea of what a hyper, this is a hyperbolic cosine. So I can change some things to make it look a little different, but <clears throat> what does it look like? Kind of looks like a parabola, right? Kind of. But it sure as heck doesn't look like uh, what cosine back in pre-cal looks like this, right? Like this does not look like a cosine function. This is a cosine hyperbolic function. That's what you're looking at here. So where, yeah, Kosh, you might hear Kosh. Um, where, where would we use a function like this? It looks like a parabola, right? I mean, pretty much. So let me see if I can do this. I think I have, let me try it with this. I don't know if this will work. I need a volunteer who's willing to be on camera. You got it? Okay. All right, so go ahead, go ahead and grab that end. So if I were to take a wire, and this is not the best wire because it's, you know, copper in there. But if you hang a wire from two points, right? Yeah, this is terrible. If you hang a wire from two points, the shape it will take on looks like a parabola, right? But it turns out that it is not a parabola. It, if you hang a wire, no matter how you do it, if we come together or move apart, stretch it like that, that shape right there is not parabolic. It is guaranteed that it is a hyperbolic cosine function. So these are called catenaries. Any wire hanging can be described with a hyperbolic cosine function. So if you try to fit a parabola to this, you would be off. Like maybe you get it to match up pretty good here, but then it would be way off up here. Does that make sense? Okay, that's good. I needed a better wire. Um, so these, these are really valuable to us. If you think about, um, think about uh, electric you know, utility poles, right? And we hang these wires between them, right? So let's say you have two utility poles, right? Like us say this is a pole, right? And this is a pole. And you're gonna have this wire which has some mass to it, right? Which has some weight to it. Then there's, wherever you connect it to this pole, there's gonna be a force, right, pulling? It might be worth it for us to know how much force is gonna be pulling and in what direction. So wouldn't it be nice to know what that angle is where we're coming in, this angle right here, like what that angle is? Yes? Because then we would have like the, the angle, the, the direction of our force. Well, to find that angle, what we need to do is find the slope of that line. And to find the slope of that line, we just need to take the derivative of the function, right? But what function? Well, a cosine hyperbolic function. Not a problem. Does that make, yeah? So, all right. I just wanted you to see a cosine hyperbolic function. Um, what do you think a sine hyperbolic function looks like? It would be like a, like a straight down and then straight back up, like a, like a sharp angle. Well, let me do this. Let me just change my code here. OK. Wait a minute, did I do? Yeah, I did sign her box. Something ain't right with my plot here. Yeah, it's, I don't have negative values. I need, you know what, I'll do this. Just because I wasn't ready to show them all on that page. Let me just go to Desmos. Y'all familiar with this one? Yeah, this is a really good one. Um, sine hyperbolic x, here we go. There's sine hyperbolic x. Here's cosine hyperbolic x. Totally different graphs, right? It's not like sine and cosine from pre-cal where they're pretty similar, just like phase shifted. Totally different graphs. Tangent hyperbolic x. Same line. Uh, same line. Thank you. Tangent hyperbolic x. Kind of looks like arctangent did from pre-cal. So 
the, the moral of the story here is that they are very different than, than our standard six trig functions, all right? So let's, let's, uh, let's do a couple of things with these. First, let's, if you were to be asked without a calculator to figure out what sine hyperbolic of four is, then what would we need to do? Well, we'd need the definition, right? So the definition, I'll put it on the board here, sine hyperbolic of x is equal to 1 half e to the x plus or minus? minus? Minus e to the negative x, right? So if we want to know what sine hyperbolic of 4 is, you'll hear me say sine hyperbolic or hyperbolic sine. You can say it either way, like either put the sine in front of the hyperbolic or the hyperbolic in front of sine pretty much accepted, you could go both ways with that. So this is just one half e to the fourth, right? Minus e to the negative four, right? And then you could get on your calculator and type in, you know, e to the fourth, and you get some numerical answer, right? So it's just plug in, that's it. So nothing fancy there, no? Okay, what about this? Um, what is, What if you're asked to show that sine hyperbolic of negative x is equal to negative sine hyperbolic x? What if we're asked to show that is true? So how could we show that that's true? This is like, remember in pre-cal when you like proved identities? You start with one side and try and turn it into the other side? So let's start, let's start over here. Let's, let's rewrite this. What is this? By definition, what, or I erased it. By definition, this is 1 half e to the what? It's, the formula says e to the x, right? But we're plugging in negative x. Negative. So this is going to be negative x. And then minus e to the, the formula is negative x, but we have negative going in. So negative negative x is positive x like that, right? So that's the left-hand side. So this is your left-hand side. And then what if I just take that left-hand side and I notice that this looks a lot like sine hyperbolic x, except these are kind of in the wrong order, right? So why don't I factor negative 1 out? And that would make this one become negative and this one become positive. And then I'll change the order. So I switch the order of these and pull the negative out. And what is this? Yeah, if you cover that up, that's hyperbolic sine x right there. And I just have a negative in front of it. So this is negative sine hyperbolic x. Do you all see that? Sure. All right, so what type of function is the hyperbolic sine function? What, it's an odd function because odd functions behave like this f of negative x equals negative f of x. This is what it means to be odd. To be an odd function, when you plug in a negative, it's the same as plugging in a positive, but making that answer negative. So plugging a negative into the hyperbolic sine function is the same as plugging the positive into it, but then you just change the function negative. So it is an odd function. That's what we just proved. Do you think the hyperbolic cosine is even? Yes. Maybe, yeah. Should we, should we check? Let's, let's see if it is. Show, what does it mean to be even? Even function means Yeah, they're the same thing. If you plug in negative or positive, you get the same answer. Right, so that was it means to be even. So is this true? Is cosine hyperbolic of negative x equal to cosine hyperbolic of x? And I'm going to leave a question mark because we're not sure yet, right? So let's do the left side. According to the formula, this would be 1 half, parenthesis, e to the what? 
x plus this time e to the negative x. Yes? Sure. Okay. So look, let me put this on the board again for you because it's it's in your notes, but it's not on the board. This is the definition of cosine hyperbolic. That's that's what cosine hyperbolic of x is, right? So if I plug in negative x here, this one should be negative, and this one should be plus, right? And the question is, is that the same as this? Is this this? Yeah, it's that, right? Because addition, you can just flip it over, and you'd get that. So this is 1 half e to the x plus e to the negative x, which equals that. So yes, it is an even function. Okay, let's do one more of these. Something a little more challenging. <clears throat> let's show, let's show that cosine hyperbolic of x plus y equals cosine hyperbolic x, cosine hy hyperbolic y, <coughs> plus sine hyperbolic x, sine hyperbolic y. All right, that's going to be a little more involved. So just so we have it, I'll put it here on the board just so we have it. Remember, cosine hyperbolic x is 1 half e to the x plus e to the negative x. Sine hyperbolic x is a half e to the x minus e to the negative x. We're going we're gonna to do this one, and then once we're done, we're going to start talking about what are the derivatives of these. Okay? So, ooh, where do we begin? So do you remember when you're trying to like, prove identities that you should usually start with the more difficult, complicated side and try and make it turn into the easier looking side? All right, so I'm going to look at the easier side real quick and just I'm going to write down what this is by definition so I know where I'm trying to get to. What is this by definition? According to that, it would be 1 half e to the whatever the argument is, x plus y and then plus e to the negative x minus y. You could just distribute the negative. So we're treating that entire argument like this right here. So we're putting it here, and then we're making it negative. Does everyone follow that? OK, that's where we're trying to get. We need to show that this side here is actually this. OK? Let's see if we can get there. So now, starting with the right-hand side, I'm going to write out all of these. Cosine hyperbolic of x is 1 half e to the x plus e to the negative x times cosine hyperbolic y, 1 half e to the y plus e to the negative y plus sine hyperbolic x, 1 half e to the x plus e to the negative x uh, no, I messed that up. That's a minus. And then times sine hyperbolic y, e to the y minus e to the negative y. Okay, are y'all okay with this or no so far? Like what I just put on the board with the right hand side, any responses would be great? All right. Rasul, did I call on you last time? I didn't, did I? No. I didn't, right?
Right, so I'm going to multiply these together. <coughs> All right? Yeah. So the half and the half go together, you get one fourth, right? Yeah. Okay, so we got one fourth. And then you've got to do like a foil here. So what's that going to give me? E to the x times e to the y. E to the x plus y, right? You're adding the exponent. So that gives you e to the x plus y. And I'm really happy to see this because my answer's got to have some things like that, right? Okay. Um, and then I've got to do this to here. So that'll be a plus because this is positive and positive. So that'll be e to the x plus negative y, right? So minus y. And then we have plus again here, which would give us e to the negative x plus y. And the last one, Russell, would be what? Plus e to the negative x minus y, right? Because you're adding those up. So minus x minus y. Okay, so that's what I get when I expand out the first two. And then we have to go over here and expand this one out, right? Okay, well, that's life. We've got to do it. So plus, now another one-fourth. And now here. Here times here, e to the x plus y. It's almost the same thing, isn't it? Except there's some minuses in here, right? So this one times that one we just did, but this one times this one, this is going to be a negative, isn't it? It'll be minus because this is positive and negative. So this will be minus e to what power? X minus y. And then this one times this one, that's going to be another minus, right? Negative x plus y. And then negative x plus y. And then the last one here and here, this will be positive and then e to the negative x minus y. Isn't it true also they have a common denominator so you could actually cancel out what's in quantity? They have a common denominator. They have a common denominator of four. Oh yeah, so well. You can start getting rid of e to, the, e to the powers. You can start canceling things out. The way I was gonna do it, I mean, you're right. The way that I was gonna do it without having to rewrite all this is since this has a one-fourth in front and this has a one-fourth in front, right? I can factor a one-fourth out of both of those and put a bracket like that. Okay, so that the one-fourth came out of that quantity and that quantity and just went out there in front, yeah? And now the parentheses aren't necessary. These parentheses aren't necessary, these parentheses aren't necessary, which means things will start to cancel, which is, I think, what you were saying, right? Okay, so what cancels here? That one right there, that one. This one and that one, right? And then you get two e to the x plus y. Yeah, so this one and this one are the same, right? So I have a one fourth. I have two of these guys added together. So two e to the x plus y. So I took care of that, took care of that, and then I have two of these, right? This one right here, and this one right here are two of those. They're being added together, so plus. 2e to the negative x minus y. Do you all see what we can do next? Pull the 2 out. The front becomes a half. And what's left inside? e to the x plus y plus e to the negative x minus y, which is the left-hand side done. Right? That's what we were trying to show. That's where we were trying to get. So it's a lot of algebra, but it's just algebra, right? Are there any questions on that? So we have this identity now. Does this identity look familiar? We had something like that for the sine and cosine function back in pre-cal. These were called the sum, difference form, sum and difference formulas. This is kind of like a sum formula for the cosine hyperbolic function. And there's, there's many more. All right, so um, let's move on to talking about the derivatives of these guys.
So please understand that we now have introduced six new hyperbolic functions, right? Six of them. Sine, cosine, tangent, and then all their reciprocals. All those hyperbolics, right? So we want to know the derivatives. So let's talk about the first one. If, let's say, y is equal to the hyperbolic sine function, then find y prime, find its derivative. So how do you think we can do that? What would you hope it is? What would you hope the derivative of this is? Yeah, but like in pre-cal, right? Or in cal 1, derivative of sine is cosine. is cosine, right? So the derivative of the hyperbolic sine function, we, we would hope it's cosine hyperbolic, right? Wouldn't that make life good? Because then it would just be the same thing, pretty much, in your mind? Let's just check it. So how do we do this? We have to take the derivative of the hyperbolic sine function, right? But we actually know what this function is. It's, this is the definition of it, right? And so long as we can differentiate this, we're in business. And can we differentiate exponential functions? Yes, from Cal 1 we can, right? So let's take the derivative of this. <clears throat> y prime should be so what happens with this constant that's out front that's being attached to it? When I take the derivative, it's just going to come along, right? The constants will come along because it's, atta it's attached by multiplication. And then I can take the derivative term by term. So derivative of e to the x is just itself, e to the x. And now be real careful here. Minus, minus, minus. The derivative of e to the negative x is itself right, times the derivative of what's up here, negative one. So the derivative of this is itself times the chain rule derivative of what's up there. So it should be negative e to the negative x, right? So I'm supposed to put here negative e to the negative x, like that, right? And then when I put that together, I get e to the x plus e to the negative x, and lo and behold, that is the hyperbolic cosine function. Question. Yes? Uh, why didn't we do any sort of derivative uh, of one half? Oh, it's a constant. Because it's a constant attached to the function in the front, right? It's not a constant by itself. It's attached through multiplication in the front, scalar, scalar multiplication. So there's no product rule? That's right, no. I mean, technically, you could do a product rule. But it, but you shouldn't. It's kind of like this. If, if you have like y equals 4x four four x squared, we all know the derivative of that is 8x, right? But you, you could, if you want, do a product rule. You could do the derivative of this by itself, which is 0 times x squared, then plus the, the derivative of x squared, which is 2x, but then times 4, and you'd get 8x. But that's a waste of time. Right? Sure. Yeah. So constants in front of functions, always just hide them, take your derivative, and then bring it in at the end. All right, so the derivative of hyperbolic sine function is cosine hyperbolic. Right? So that's one less thing you have to really think about, right? The derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. The derivative of hyperbolic sine of x is cosine hyperbolic x. All right, let's try the, the cosine hyperbolic then. If we start out with cosine hyperbolic of x, what is the derivative of that? What do we hope it is? <clears throat> Negative sine hyperbolic, right? That's what we're hoping for? Let's see. So let's write out the definition of the cosine hyperbolic function. So our derivative will be 1 half comes for the ride. Derivative of e to the x is itself. And then what was the derivative of e to the negative x again? Negative, negative e to the negative x. But then we have addition, which is subtraction. So this becomes minus e to the minus x. And what is this? 
That is exactly sine hyperbolic x. What did we say we hoped it was? Negative. negative sine hyperbolic x. It is not negative sine hyperbolic x. It is sine hyperbolic x. So this is the first time we've seen it's a little bit different, right? This is a little different. So I could continue to go on and go through the derivatives for all six of these. But if you refer to reference page five again, formulas 25 through 30 will give you the derivatives of all the hyperbolic functions. So derivative of sine hyperbolic x is cosine hyperbolic x. Derivative of cosine hyperbolic x is sine hyperbolic x. What do you think the derivative of tangent hyperbolic x is? You hope it's secant squared hyperbolic, right? And it is, okay? So that's good news. And then the other three are here also, right? So I'm not going to go through all those, but please understand these six are now on the table, all right? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to see if you can't guess what's coming next now. Let me, let me do it this way. We know sine x, right? Cosine x, tangent x. There's six of these pre-cal, right? Do we know their derivatives? So for each of these, we know a derivative, 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 six of them, right? Guys, I just y'all are just sitting there chatting. I, I hear it, so everyone hears it. It's a little distracting. Unless you have a question. No? OK, just keep it down. We have the six trig functions, we have their derivatives. Then we talk about the inverse trig functions, right? Six of those. And we talked about their derivatives last class. Okay, we just talked about the hyperbolic trig functions, right? Six of them. And we just talked about their derivatives, right? What's next? the inverse hyperbolic trig functions. So now we have an inverse hyperbolic trig function, an inverse hyperbolic, you know, cosine, uh, you know what, you can put the negative on the wrong place, it doesn't matter. Okay, and so each of these hyperbolic functions has an inverse, and each of these has a derivative. So we're talking about one, two, three, four, 24 functions, and each of them has a derivative, 24 derivatives, right? And what we need to know is that this, for, this formula sheet contains every single one of these, all right? And all the derivatives are here. So on a test, if you have something in, in there, you've got to take the derivative of the inverse hyperbolic cosine function. This is where you go, all right? Just know it's here. So um, let's talk about you know, you know how in this one I gave you the definition of the hyperbolic function over here? This is the definition. If you plug x into that sine function, you just plug x into that, right? So is there a formula for the inverse? Okay, let's see how y'all do with this. So let's see here. Let's say y is equal to the hyperbolic inverse hyperbolic sine function. So on this one, there's the formula. Is there a formula for this one? We're not talking derivatives yet, right? We're not talking about the derivative of it. We're just talking about, you know, if I ask you right now, what is the sine hyperbolic inverse of, of four? Like, what would you do with that four? You plug it into something, right? Into what? That's what I'm asking. Do we have a formula for it, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the formula in the book. You ready? Here it is. And then we're gonna actually derive the formula. So here's, here's the actual formula for it. Natural log of x plus the square root of x squared plus one. And this is good for all x that are elements of the real number. So you can plug the domain of that inverse hyperbolic function is all real numbers. I feel like I'm missing. You can no. Use a negative, obviously, the radical, right? Or zero. It, you could put a negative in here because when you square it and add one, it'll always be positive. All right. Does it surprise you at all that the inverse hyperbolic sine function has a natural log in it? Why should that not surprise you? 
because the original function has e's in it, right? And so the inverse should probably have logs in it. All right, so I really like this example. So before we do it, I just want to make sure everyone remembers how you find the inverse of a function if somebody gives you a function. And I'm going to give you a very basic example from, from college algebra. Let's say you're given a function f of x equals 3x minus 4, and you're asked to find the inverse function. So do you all remember? I'm going to start doing it unless someone has a... Yes? Yeah, okay, you flip the x and the y, but there's no y yet. So the first step would be replace f of x with y. That look, okay, so you replace f of x with y, and then you switch them. You make the y the x, and you make the x the y. And then solve for y. So then I would add 4 to both sides. And then I would divide by 3. So I get 1 third x plus 4 thirds equals y, and this is our inverse function. So what does that mean? What, what the hell do we just do? What it means is that if we were to take, let's say like the number 6, let's plug the number 6 into this function. What would happen if we plug 6 into there? So if we plug in 6 and we send it through this function f, what would it spit out? Six, uh, 3 times 6, right? 18. Take away 4, so 14, right? The inverse function should send 14 back to 6. So what would happen if I plug 14 into this? So if I go back like this, f inverse, let's see. So what happens if I plug 14 in right here? 1 third times 14, right? And then plus 4 thirds. So that's 14 thirds plus 4 thirds. That's 18 thirds, and that's 6. Why are you plugging in a, a, a 6? I'm sorry, why did you do that? I'm, I'm, I'm just showing you what we what we did here. If, you, if somebody gives me a function, I can go through this algebraic process to find its inverse. Right? right? I can go through this process. I'm, just ver I'm trying to verify that this works. That if I just pick an arbitrary number and plug it in here, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take, this function will take that number and send it somewhere. The inverse function should send that, that answer back to where it came from. So I just picked 6 arbitrarily. Okay, gotcha. okay? So we all understand the function, the inverse, how they work, right? Okay, so I would like for us to show that this is the inverse of that function, right? So this function here is like 3x minus 4 over here. We need to go through this procedure. With me? Sure? Okay, let's start out with this. We want to know what this is. This is a question mark. We're going to get to this answer. So I'm going to start with this. My function I'm trying to find the inverse of is 1 half e to the x minus e to the negative x. So this is a good challenge problem because, you know, in all my years of teaching this class, Cal 2, I still don't think I've ever had a student be able to take this one all the way. So this will be a good test to see if anyone here can do this. So first step was replace f of x with y, right? Okay, so let's do that. So I hope, what I'm saying by that is I hope uh, you'll learn something from this. Okay, once you replace f of x with y, what do you do? Switch your x and y, right? So everywhere you see an x, put a y. Everywhere you see a y, put an x. If that, if what I'm doing here, uh, that doesn't do it. If this whole thing about like switching the x and y and doing all that, if that doesn't sound familiar, just trust that that you did see that at some point in the past. Okay, you should have. All right, so far, good. Now what? Solve for y. Hmm. So I'm
Anybody having any progress on it? Yes. Can I come by and take a look? that the definite by definition sine x times its inverse is zero, then we could also agree it's, that it's not zero. Or they cancel each other, is what I mean. Not that way. Through composition they cancel. So sine of sine inverse of <laughs> x is x, not zero. Or sine inverse of sine of x is x. Definitely what do you mean? That's right. That's right. So the way to think about this is, you know, inverse functions send things back to where they came from. So let's say I start off with, a, with an x, and I send it through some function, right? It's going to come out to be something over here. If I take that answer and send it through its inverse, it goes back to where it came from. That's the whole 